All right, good evening. It's the Jew 23 Community Podcast. It's clarity for those who are curious or confused about all things Christian. I'm Jeremiah Wood, along with Dr. Nick Hartcastle, and this is episode 19. Nick, we went live last week and got a great start on uh, what it looked like to kind of be live in uh, in our broadcasting, and I think it went really well. I got a lot of really good feedback throughout the week. Um, did you hear anything from anybody that saw us? Uh, just the usual, which is, I think my mom. So yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's about it. But, uh, I think my oh, mom. so yeah, <laughs> there we go. Sorry. <laughs> I, I was trying to get my, uh, share button going and, uh, get a little bit of background noise in there. So no, that's yeah. what happened to me last week. I'm, I'm glad we're back though. Yeah. Same, same, same. Um, so if you were with us last week, we kind of were wrapping up the whole idea of Hagar. Uh, no, we were wrapping up the idea of Abram and his nephew Lot. And uh, we just talked a little bit about that. And now we're diving into Genesis chapter 15. And um, yeah, if you want to join us in Genesis chapter 15, that's where we're going to get started. And we're just going to kind of break this down. Uh, let me tell you this. When it comes to... So Genesis is my favorite book in the Bible. And when it comes to my favorite story in the Bible, Abram, uh, Abraham is really one of my favorite stories. And the story of the covenant is darn near one of my favorite chapters, uh, chapter 15 uh, in the scripture. So um, we're going to read through the whole chapter tonight, and then we're just going to start going back through and breaking it down. Sound like a plan? Sounds like a plan. I, uh, I love this chapter also, so... Hopefully um, that means some good stuff will come up, but hopefully that means that uh, we'll let the Holy Spirit lead it instead of uh, yeah. making Jeremiah. So sweet. Well, that's been, it, it's kind of funny when you say that, Nick, because I, I think a lot of people don't even realize uh, how we kind of accidentally stumbled across, across that. Uh, our first couple episodes, you can find it on our YouTube. Um, in our first couple episodes, we tried to map it out and have an itinerary to follow and we were kind of following a general outline, and it was fine, but it wasn't awesome. It didn't have the the pizzazz or the flair to it. And then one night, we both were behind schedule, and we thought, hey, let's just wing it. Let's just walk through. And man, the Lord was just all over it. And so uh, we thought, well, maybe we're on to something. So we've been just winging it ever since, <laughs> and it's worked out really well. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, you want to get us kicked off on uh, Genesis chapter 15? Yep. Let's do it. Let's dive right in. Chapter 15, starting in verse 1, it says this. It says, uh, After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, and I am your very great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Abram continued, look, you have given me no offspring to, uh, so a slave born in my house will have to be my heir. Now the word of the Lord came to him. This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took he took him outside and said, Look at the sky and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to them, Your offspring will be that numerous. Abraham believed the Lord and, he was, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans and to give you this land to possess. But he said, Lord God, how can I know that I will possess this land? Then the Lord said to him, Bring me, three, bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. All right, chapter 15, verse 10. Abram brought all these things and cut them in two and arranged the halves opposite each other and the birds. However, he did not cut in half. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. And as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for four hundred years. 
but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. And in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. And when the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, and from the river of Egypt to the river of the Euphrates, and the land of the Ken- Kenites, Kizites, Kemodites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephelites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Mm, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, this is... Uh, a jammed packed chapter. And so let's just start in verse one and kind of walk through it, see what kind of understanding we can get from this this evening. Uh, Nick, uh, chapter 15, verse one, it starts off by saying after these events, right? And so the events that happened were what we just read about the last two weeks. Uh, Abram's nephew, Lot, uh, he made his way down into uh, Sodom. Um, He was drawn to the city. He became part of the city. He fully integrated into the city, assimilated with uh, everything of the world. And ultimately, he became collateral damage when that world system got swept away uh, in its own consequences. Uh, Abram heard that his nephew was taken away. And so Abram went after Lot to bring him back. The Lord gave him favor The Lord uh, showed him, um, well, they pursued for what, like 200, 250 miles. They got everything back. They brought everyone back, and they were victorious in their their pursuits. Now, here's what's interesting. When they got back, they had that meeting with Melchizedek. They had that meeting with the king of Sodom. Um, It was was a lot. And then uh, at the end of everything, Everyone went back to their homes and all was safe and sound in that moment. And so when we look at 15 verse 1, it says, after these events, how long after these events do you suppose that probably was? Oh, hold on, Nick. I'm not hearing you. I got you muted. There you go. There we go. Yeah, it doesn't say. So I think really the big part about it is, um, to me, it kind of leads me to think that whenever he starts talking about a reward and he turned down um, kind of his reward that he had gotten from, I guess, defeating um, that large army who had taken Lot, um, it makes me feel like the God saying, hey, you trusted me, you gave your stuff back, you decided to rely on me instead of your worldly possessions your reward is going to be great. So I feel like that the Lord's kind of speaking to him right on the heels of that story coming off of that. I don't know. It doesn't specifically say, how does it, uh, how do you interpret it, Jeremiah? Um, you know, I don't know, but I, I kind of get the same feeling that it seemed like chapter 13 and 14 were almost a test, right? And not a test like, let's yeah. see if Abraham gets it right. But testing his heart to make sure it was conditioned to receive everything that the Lord had to offer him. And so if you remember, even going back to uh, chapter 12, Abram uh, found himself in a tough time. And so he decided to make his way towards the city. And this whole idea of going towards the city is uh, giving your life over and finding your identity in the world rather than your identity in Christ. And after that whole crisis moment... Uh, He found himself back uh, at the Oaks of Mamre, and he was worshiping the Lord again, and he was finding his identity in the Lord. And so um, it seemed like after that, when Lot was taken, like this was a test. Is, Is Abram going to, is his heart going to rely on the things of this world, or is his heart going to rely on the Lord, his God? And I think after everything he went through, it showed that his heart was completely given over to God. His identity was completely given over to God, and he trusted in God um, from the beginning 
all the way to the very end. And so to me, it kind of seems like Abram, was his heart was being tested for this moment. And the Lord found that he was ready. And, and what did the Lord end up saying to Abram? Yeah, uh, I mean, he says straight away in 15 verse 1, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward will be great. And I think it kind of also is relatively unique as well when you brought up the fact that what Abram had just done is he gave Lot back. Um, so mm. he, he uh, we kind of need to rem- remember that whenever we're starting to talk about this story moving into uh you know, verse two and three, when we start getting a little bit of like Abram sass in here, because um, in chapter in verse two, uh, Abram really gets down and points out the fact says, Oh Lord, uh, what will you give me for? I continue childless and the heir of my household is Eliezer of Damascus. So, you know, Abram's coming here and saying, you know, you've promised me that I will be a great nation. You've already promised this. I'm starting to step into this story. I'm starting to trust you. Um, but he honestly is still working some stuff out. And the Lord is leaving plenty of space for him to do that. Uh, but it really, at this point in time, kind of one thing that we talked about in a previous podcast is that to Abram, if Lot was with him, Lot would have been the heir of his household because he would have been the oldest yeah. male in his household. And what we just saw was Abram gave him back up in an effort to trust the Lord. And it says kind of one of those situations to where he says, um, you know, I've followed you. I've done what you said. Uh, How can you make me uh, believe that I actually can be a great nation, that you truly are going to give me all of those things? It just seems like he's kind of in a space to where he is trusting the story. He's learning to kind of walk with God. But he's really wanting to know more about this 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 promise that the Lord's laying out to him. You know, Jeremiah, yeah. kind of, what does it make you feel like he's thinking there? Well, it's funny that after all of these events, after everything that happened, you know, he gave a tenth to Melchizedek. He was blessed. He came back, and the very first thing that God says to Abram, He says, "Don't be afraid." Like, I'm trying to figure out what is it that. God is speaking to Abram about when he's saying, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what? What is he, what is he speak? What what issue in Abram's life is he speaking to? And he goes and says, Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, and your reward will be very great. Right? And um Abram's response goes right into what can you give me <laughs> since I'm childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Right. Um, And so is Abram's fear wrapped up in not having an heir? Is Abram's fear wrapped up in uh, Lot returning to his uh, sinful identity versus um, becoming, finding his identity in God and finding his identity uh, back in the house of of Abram? it's funny too because uh, it says Abram continued and it said that you have given me no offspring so a slave born in my house will have to be my heir. And it's interesting that there's a there's an interesting break there, right? Mm-hmm. And it says Abram was saying this and so between chapter 2 and chapter 3 um whenever we learned this a while back uh whenever there's a break like that um it almost signifies that there was an extended period of silence, right? Like God hadn't answered him yet. It wasn't like Abram was just continuing in the conversation. His, his conversation was, was almost in two parts. So in verse two, he says, Lord God, what can you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And then there's just silence. Like the Lord didn't answer him. And we don't know how long that silence was. The scripture doesn't give us that understanding. Um, and then he continued to talk and said, look, you've given me no offspring and the slave born in my house will have to be my heir. And verse four, it says, now the word of the Lord came to him. So again, there was probably silence 
after that. So I want to chew on that for a minute. How do we feel and how do we react when we ask the Lord? Like we feel like we've heard from the Lord and then we ask the Lord or we answer the Lord um, the question we were asked and all of a sudden there's silence. Nick, how do we deal with the silence we receive from the Lord sometimes? I think that Abram is showing a really good example of how we as humans can kind of commonly deal with it. Because, I mean, that silence to me, he was probably sitting there like dwelling on that question. Mm He's like, like, God, why won't you answer me in this? And he honestly, I think, got emotional and fired up and, you know, doubled down and said, I want an answer on this. So I think, honestly, whenever we sit in that space, we, we probably have some choices to make that we might struggle with as humans at times. You know, likely what we're being told to do is just sit there and trust and dwell and pursue the Lord. But what I love about Abram in this really in this instance and in so many throughout there, he shows the fact that um, he can be emotional with God and God can take it and deal with it like he can give God 100% of who Abram is. And that's Mm -hmm. the guy that God chooses to work with. So I think one part about it is, is to trust, but the other part about it is to identify how we can be real with God. So I think a lot of times in that silence, we start probably internalizing a lot of stuff and sitting here thinking like, why am I not hearing this? What's going on? Why can't I deal with these things to the Lord instead of externalizing it and actually just put, putting it back to the Lord and saying, listen, I trust you and I need you to talk to me right now on this. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting too is Abram's um, response is a direct response to the, the statement that the Lord made to Abram. He didn't ask Abram a question. He made a statement. He said, don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your reward will be very great. And and it seems like maybe this conversation in verses two and three that Abraham's having is his way of working through his doubt, right? And sometimes when we hear from the Lord, we have this expectation of we think that the, the Lord should answer us and give us everything we ever hoped and dreamed and it should be easy, so on and so forth. Um, But sometimes we have to sit and actually work through our doubt in order for the word of the Lord to really come to pass. And one thing I kind of like about that is it shows even more like Abram's just being a a person in this because the Lord just walks and says, Hey, don't fear your, I'm your shield. Your reward is going to be great. And then Abram immediately takes it and turns it on kind of himself. Mm -hmm. It's like, instead of actually just sitting there listening to what the Lord has to say, where it seems to be right there is he's talking about protection. God's trying to like break down and say, I'm going to protect you and you will be blessed out of this. And, but Abram's like, okay, but how can this be true? Because you, you, you just left me out here to be alone for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So, I think that we probably can see ourselves in that same situation sometimes where the Lord talks to us and gives us a word, but it's also about how we respond to it. Um, And that might actually kind of initiate how the Lord wants to partner with us in that situation. If he needs us to learn a little bit more, grow, grow some more ourselves, or if he's ready to go ahead and continue on with that. So right, it's just a super good conversation to kind of start, bringing in some really good dialogue that we see here of a man and the Lord. Because one thing that we really pointed out prior to this point in Genesis is that most of the time when people actually spoke, they were actually participating in the anti-story. Now, you got it, Adam and Eve, the first time that they spoke, Eve was actually, uh, you know, eating the fruit. Uh, Cain responding to God after he had killed Abel, um, you know, so on and so forth. Noah, he was quiet until he got off the ark and he had, uh, you know, got drunk in the vineyard. So right now what this is actually starting to show is a more personal relationship that the Lord is inviting you to be a part of 
and he's making mm-hmm. space for you if you can actually live in that personal relationship. He can take whoever you are as long as you'll just walk through it with him. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. And when you look at verse 4, after Abram has actually worked through his doubt, now the Lord is about to reveal to him, let me tell you what I meant when I said that I'm your shield, I'm your buckler, I'm, I'm what protects you, I'm what holds everything together. So let me take that and show you um, now what your reward is going to be. So it was after he worked through everything that now the Lord is able to show him what his reward is. He says, your, um, this one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. And so he took him outside and he said, I want you to look up in the sky. I want you to count the stars. And if you are able to count them, he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. So um, again, just for clarity's sake, when the Lord said, look at the stars, that's how um, numerous your offspring will be. He was saying the, the, the count will be infinite, right? He was not saying, hey, as many stars as you count, that's how many offspring you're going to have. No, he said your offspring are going to be numerous like the stars. And I think he's also sitting there, God sitting there saying, um, hey, buddy, go outside and look up. I piece this all yeah. together. Like, he's not just sitting there saying, go count it, and that's how, how big your family will be. He's sitting there saying, all right, you got to recognize who you're talking to right here. Yeah. I put all of that together. And the funny part about it that I kind of love is that Abram goes out there and he's just completely silent. Really after this, he's just sitting there kind of put in his place because he looks up at the awe of God. And one thing that I think that just kind of popped up in my mind whenever we were going through this and we were talking about um, whenever he said he looked up at the stars in the sky, so if you're able to count them. And if we go back to the original mention of these stars in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, and said, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for a sign and for seasons and for days and for years. And I think also if you are really kind of building off of that, it's that specifically God's telling him that not only am I going to make a, a great thing out of you, a big creation, but it will go on for all time. Because if that yeah. point in time, if you were, if you really had the same uh, relationship with like the stars that you did as this old Eastern culture, it's like they were pretty much there to help you understand that like seasons are changing, times are moving. It's a, it's a new festival. It's a new season and everything like that. God's sitting there saying that you're going to be blessed and it is going to continue forever. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the interesting part is that. The answer came when Abram became silent. Yeah. Right. I was just, I ran into a buddy of mine just about an hour ago after I was dropping the kids off at at youth group and I ran by and grabbed some food and I saw my buddy out front and we were, he was telling me about, um, he's a pastor friend and he was telling me about a vision the Lord had given him and, and, uh, how he went and had a prayer retreat. He went out to the lake and he just laid down by himself and, and just had a prayer retreat with the Lord. And um, he said, man, the Lord just spoke to me so clearly. And so I was teasing him. And I said, hey, we should. I said, you need to tell me how uh, what, what your formula was to go out and make the Lord speak to you so clearly. I said, then we can market it. And then we could sell it. And then we can make people uh, grow their churches with it and all kinds of stuff. And I was just, I was just joking with him, right? And he says, no, you're right. There's, there is a, there's a formula. It's called silence and solitude. If, if you will have some silence and solitude, you will definitely hear from the Lord more clearly than if you were just running around in your daily busy life. And, and that was good. That was really good. And I think we were seeing the same thing here, right? Uh, chapter one, the Lord, or verse one anyway, the Lord speaks to Abraham. Verses two and three, the, uh, Abraham's struggling with doubt and it's it, he's not getting the answers that he wants, but he's airing out his grievances. 
And then, like you said, all of a sudden, once he gets silent, the Lord begins speaking to him. And as the Lord begins speaking to him, he remains silent because now we know that silence in the story is is showing that he is going along or he's finding his place in God's story. And um, when he's speaking, he like you said earlier, he's becoming the anti-story. And then um, as he's counting the stars, he's looking up. That was another thing. Too often, because I, I wonder how many times do we struggle uh, with our own faith because we feel like we're not hearing from the Lord like we should be, mm-hmm. right? And maybe we're not hearing from the Lord like we should be because we are not finding ourselves in a place of silence and solitude. Yeah, it's one of those things. If you make space, God will fill it. But I really like the fact that you bring that up because what you were talking about a second ago when we had a little a little break in there where it says, mm-hmm. and the Lord said for him to go out. And then there's another one of those breaks that said, then he said. We don't know how yeah. long the Lord had him out there walk, looking at the stars. Like, did he sit there and say, okay, I don't think, I honestly don't think after us talking about this, that he said, go up there and look at them. And he just looked up and he said, okay, there are the stars. I think he had him go out there and sit there in silence mm-hmm. and just, and just look at creation and just let that go ahead and sink into him and say, you know, start letting himself kind of break down his own barriers and break down his own walls. So you're exactly yeah. right. And that's one thing that we, sh- we struggle with today is, you know, we want that automatic, um, we want God to like, give us a word right away, give us a word right away. And, you know, I'll tell you, I'm guilty of it. It's like, how often yeah. do we make space to sit there and to give him time to speak? And yeah. how often do we, are we quiet enough to actually let the creator of the universe who made all the stars in the sky have an opportunity to speak in our life as opposed to just hoping that he's just going to give us a, you know, a text message right away, an instant reply. So, right. Well, and you said something earlier too about Abram having to experience the greatness of God, the bigness of God. And that was part of Abram encountering the Lord uh, out there in in the stars, uh, he is in a place where he is encountering the the grandeur of who God really is, having to find himself in his own smallness. And once he can find himself in his own smallness, recognizing how big and how great the Lord really is, then Abram is able to start receiving. And so I guess my, my thought on that is, is that if, if Abram is ready to start receiving, then let me just say this in seeing the Lord rightly in all of his majesty and greatness, then Abram is ready to receive what the Lord has for him. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, Yeah, it does. I mean, I think the big part about it is we kind of often sit there and we kind of want a God that's a little bit more like us. We want a God that's um, quick to speak um, and quick to make decisions and, and, uh, and maybe tell us whatever we want just right away in in a super kind of like emotional state. But I think honestly, until you recognize the fact that you are talking to, you know, the creator of the world, somebody who, or a, a being that made you and loves every part about you, but he also knits it all together and holds it all together. Sometimes I think he's maybe waiting for you to sit there and say, all right, I need you to recognize who I am in this situation. I see who you are, but I yeah. need you to recognize me. Yeah. And he, he does that with us through silence, right? Yeah. Like, like he's incredibly silent through this whole, this whole ordeal. And, and we are uncomfortable with silence. We're uncomfortable with being in a position where we have to 
like scripture tells us, wait on the Lord, but the Lord is using that time. We, we, we honestly mistake God's silence for his absence. And that's not the case. The Lord's silence is not his absence. The silence that you feel from the Lord is meant to produce something in you. It's meant to form you or bring you into a place of formation in a way that nothing else will. And oftentimes that just requires us to sit in that place where we are able to recognize who God is and then see within ourselves who we are in comparison with him. And it's kind of one of those things, honestly, if we start talking about this silence, it's one of the things that makes humans super uncomfortable. And I don't know if it was the way back then, you know, everybody was a little bit more nomadic and spread out. Um, so silence might have been more common of a thing. But I think that if we look at what's one of the biggest enemies that we face today, silence is or the ability, the attack on silence in order to the fact that we just can't separate ourselves and give God some time is a huge one that we go through, you know, in our culture. I know right. that probably like the addiction to technology and the fact that you have everything at your fingertips doesn't help that. But, you know, Jeremiah, if I'm sitting there, you know, while I was getting ready to get on this podcast tonight, I was silent in the, in my room for like 10 minutes mm-hmm. and I'm just sitting there like mind is racing, everything's going on. And I think that if you don't actually just sit there and marinate in that silence. And when I say marinate, you know, it's kind of like marinating some, some meat. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you ever, if you ever marinate some, let's just say chicken, cause chicken needs a little help and a little flavor. You know, you get you a marinade and you put it on that meat. It doesn't say put it on there for an hour. It says usually, you know, put it on there for a few hours. Let it soak in it overnight. Yeah. You kind of need to sometimes let yourself marinate and allow yourself to be changed a little bit in there too. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, that's probably one of our biggest downfalls is the fact that we don't separate ourselves like that, like we should, um, and actually marinate and get some get some silence. Yeah. Well, and I like how it continues on in verse six. So we had Mm -hmm. Abram talking, which was kind of like the anti story, right? And then we have his silence and then the Lord leads him out into the desert to show him the stars. And we see even more silence, right? And then verse six, it says this, that Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Right. So, Mm -hmm. um, so that Abram believed God and God credited his belief to him as righteousness. Nick, what do you feel like? um, Let's break this down a little bit. What was it that Abram believed? And then why was that belief credited to him as righteousness? Yeah. This will be a good one to break down because, spoiler alert, I guess this is the first time righteousness is um, mentioned in the entirety of the Bible, I think. Mm -hmm. And then, um, in all honesty, it kind of helps us give a definition of righteousness if we start thinking about this. He says, what did he believe? Well, number one, I think the easy thing to answer is he believed that God is going to give him offspring that are going to be as numerous as the stars like at a surface level he believed that but i think if you just if whenever abram sat there and he took a moment to be quiet and to go sit out in the stars and he got the grand scheme of things and he was able to go ahead and, and let himself kind of be broken down i don't think he just simply believed that i think he believed all of truly at this point in time started believing all of the promises that the lord had spoken into him for the entirety of his life that he would make mm-hmm. him a great nation for him. Uh, he will give him, you know, a great land. He's going to give him offspring. If he blesses or he will bless him and those around him who he blesses, he will bless and he'll curse who he cursed. I think finally at this point in time, it's sunk in and it's kind of like a moment to where all of a sudden it just popped and he, he kind of got it. He yeah. didn't just trust the fact that, He's going to get a bunch of kids out of this and he's going to have to figure out some way. He believed that at this point in time, I think with his whole heart, 
that the Lord's promises are true and good. Oh, mm-hmm. What do you, I mean, what do you think, Jeremiah, when you read that, that verse? Well, again, um, it's probably just the same thing you just said, but this, this concept of believing, right, is that you are fully persuaded that something is true. And this is what is happening in Abram's life, that everything leading up to this point, uh, he is reflecting on. Again, you can tell Abram's not talking anymore. He, he got it. He's starting to figure it out. And to believe something is being fully persuaded that what God is saying to me is true. And you cannot believe something without that belief changing your behavior because how you believe is how you will behave. And so when Abram is believing, it's not just that he's being fully convinced that what God is doing is true, but it is the belief that he has about what God is saying is true is transforming how he is now going to live out the rest of his life, how he is now going to live out his behavior. And so the the reason why that is crediting uh, that God is crediting his belief into righteousness is not only was it, um, so this concept of righteousness is, has several layers to it, right? One, it is being in right relationship with God. Uh, and I think that's how we are predominantly seeing it here in Genesis 15, 6, is that Abraham believed God <clears throat> and God credited it to him as righteousness, meaning that we receive that right relationship with God, um, not because of anything we've done, but it is just that it's something that we have to receive. And so um, Abraham believed God and God allowed Abraham to be in right relationship with him. And it's just, I don't know. It's good and it's incredible when we look at what's really taking place here. And again, Abram's not speaking. He's not asking for things. It's this, it's this, uh, I was out to lunch with a brother today and we were talking about uh, how do we lay things at the feet of Jesus? How do we surrender our lives? And we started talking about the dog whisperer in Caesar Milan and how with his dogs, it's not that they learned all the tricks and how to be obedient. It's that the uh, the dog uh, owner is able to draw the dog into a place of calm, submissive nature. And I think mm-hmm. that this is what it looks like to be in right relationship with God is that you believe God, you see God rightly for who he is, and then you can find yourself in a place of a calm, submissive state where the only thing you're doing is looking up to your master uh, to uh, know and understand what is my next move? What is my, how should I feel about this? How should I understand this? How should I perceive this? What am I supposed to be believing in? And when we look up to our master in a calm, submissive state, not trusting in ourselves, but trusting in him, it brings us, he brings us into a place of right relationship. I think also there's some, a good way to unpack this is to look at the Hebrew root word in uh, the Blue Letter Bible. Because a lot of times when we start thinking about the word believe, we think it more from like our American version of understanding it or our, our, our modern version of understanding it. It's where like, if you believe something, uh, you have to have a, you know, be convinced of it. You have to have a educated stance. You need to hear all the facts. And, and after that, and I will come to, I'll believe that then we also sometimes have some skepticism with our belief, but if you go to the blue letter Bible and, uh, look at the, uh, Look at that word. It's aman, and its Mm -hmm. definition is to support, to confirm, or to be faithful. And none of those are making a statement about it having to be something that um, was convinced of. You know, I think honestly, when you're looking at it, he was faithful. He was he he was faithful in the fact that the Lord's promises were good and true. And him being faithful is what credited it as righteousness. 
It's not the fact that he was convinced that God is good. It's not the fact that he was convinced that he listened to God's argument about how big the universe was and what all he put together. It was the fact that Abram was at this point in time still faithful enough to listen to God and say, you got, you got it. I trust your story mm-hmm. and I'm going to lay it down to you. I'm, like you were saying, instead of go lay it down to the foot of the Lord. He was in that submissive state and saying, I am going to be faithful and I confirm and support your words are good for me. And that's enough. Yeah. That's so good. That's so good. Um, I think this is going to be a good place to probably call it good. Yeah. Uh, just a couple closing thoughts on this. Um, What does it look like for us to be faithful in a season of uncertainty? What does it look like for us to be faithful in a time where uh, we feel like we're doing everything right, but everything we think we're supposed to be receiving uh, isn't really happening like we thought it would happen? What does Mm -hmm. it mean for us to be faithful when the Lord gives us a word, but then gives us silence to chew on it? Like, what does faithfulness look like from this portion of scripture that we just went through? I think part of it is, is kind of like what we were talking about with Abram's silence. I think that the, the silence and solitude is the beginning of faithfulness. What do you think? What are some of your thoughts? Yeah, I think if we can unpack anything from the first six verses of this chapter right here, it's it's all there's a lot of silence and solitude and it's honestly making enough space for God to give yourself to open up your life enough for him to make some space for him to fill it. Um, I yeah. think if we kind of look at a lot about like this is that right now what we're seeing in creation is that you know God made all this space and he's going to let Abram fill it up like this land that he's given him. Mm-hmm. But as Abram's not given him enough space in his own life at this point in time for the Lord to be able to fill Abram up. So he's still working it out. Is So I guess, honestly, when we're talking about being faithful right here and how do we do it, it's actually set some time to make some space for the Lord. Or if you have this time that just keeps on popping up, kind of like Matt Lowry said at church the other day. Um, you know, if, if you're getting woke up at 2 AM for a reason, maybe the Lord's trying to get a hold of you. Right. Maybe he's trying Lowry. Yeah. Maybe he's trying to sit there and say that this is the only time I can get your attention. And if it's the only time I can get your attention, this is whenever I need you to just press in with me. So, you know, I think that right now in a season where I guess you might be having some chaos, you might be going through some stuff. You might be doubting some of the Lord's promises, he can deal with your emotions like Abram. He did with Abram at the start of this story. He can deal with all you have to do, but be honest with him. Tell him what's on your heart. Tell him honestly how you feel about it and don't just internalize it all. Externalize it and talk to God. But when you do that, make sure you make some space for him and take some time just for him to be able to show that he is the Lord and he has a plan for you. Jeremiah, what's it look like for you kind of right right now in this like season of being faithful it is it is um are you hearing all the dings i need to silence my computer real quick um yeah the idea of being faithful in these moments um really really center around that one thing that calm submissive trust in the lord that I don't need to figure out what I need to do to make something happen, but that I can calmly and um, I think my, sorry, I think my stuff froze for a second. Yeah, it's just the, it's just the being that calm, submissive, laying it down uh, <clears throat> at the feet of Jesus and letting him lead and letting him be the one that calls the, calls the shots and, and being how to how to explain it being secure in that process so i think that's where faithfulness starts that's good now i guess uh it's the walk go live it uh yeah for sure yeah
Well, sweet. I think that's a, that's some deep thoughts to kind of wrap this one up on. Um, we had intentions of getting all the way through Genesis chapter 15. Uh, but, uh, there's, there's so much good stuff here that I'm glad we're going to take at least more than one week to kind of unpack it because I think that, uh, what we're going to get into next will also kind of speak as something about a level of just, uh, trust in the Lord and being submissive to him as well. Yeah. Yep. That's good. It's good. Well, Hey, thank you guys so much for joining us again tonight. Uh, I got a little distracted. I was fielding some messages. Um, anyway, you guys are a blessing. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the likes. Thanks for the comments. Uh, love it when you guys interact with us in, uh, on the various channels. Um, so yeah, we'll probably, we'll be putting these videos out on our YouTube channel, uh, as, as we have time. And, uh, we will also, I, I don't know, Nick, do you like being able to get on here live? Um, Every Wednesday? Yeah, I think it works out pretty well. So at least we're going to try to keep doing that as we can. As Right. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Fantastic. Well, again, this is the G23 Community Podcast. Clarity for those who are confused or curious about all things Christian. And I guess we'll see you next week. Nick disappeared on me. Hey, thanks for joining us. God bless. We'll see you again real soon. <laughs>